This is Live Well Talk on advances in gastroenterology. I'm Dr. Dustin Arnold, Chief Medical Officer at Unity Point Health, St. Luke's, Cedar Rapids. Uh, March is a is an interesting month. It is uh, it has the Ides of March, uh, spring break. Uh, it's National Celery Month, uh, but it's also Colon Cancer Awareness Month. And this March is extra historic because our go-to gastroenterologist, Dr. Abramson, will be retiring. Uh, after 30 years in practice here in Cedar Rapids, uh, I did meet him once, probably in 1991, and he did have hair at that time. Uh, we put in his, uh, I worked for Fleming Irrigation, we put in your sprinkler system, Dean. I, you know, I hope it still worked. Uh, but joining me today, he's going to talk about uh, not only colon cancer, but also kind of take a look back at gastroenterology and some of the milestones that we've seen in, in technology. So, Dr. Abramson, welcome back to the podcast. Thank you. So uh, I think you and Tony Carter both yeah. put in our sprinkler system. Yep. And re remarkably, considering that two docs in the making were working on it, it did work. So Good. excellent. Glad to hear that. <laughs> so, so, yeah, so when I finished my fellowship in 1989, uh, col colorectal cancer screening was, was very different uh, and very disorganized. So there was no such thing as screening colonoscopy at that time. Uh, and there weren't really recommendations for a blood testing either. And certainly uh, the Cologuard DNA test didn't exist. So we were doing colonoscopies at the time on people with symptoms, rectal bleeding, changes in bowel habits. Uh, and we had known for 20 years beforehand that there was what's called the adenoma carcinoma sequence, that colon polyps, adenomatous polyps, over five to 10 years could become uh, colon cancer. So we all kind of intellectually knew that if you intervened in that, in that uh, sequence of events, you could probably decrease the risk for colon cancer development and subsequent death. Uh, but that, that took uh, many studies over the years to actually prove. So the, the first study that suggested survival advantage for screening colonoscopy was in 1993 of the National Polyp Study. And that was with eight or 10 different uh, large uh, institutions pooled data. And they showed a survival advantage for people who underwent a single colonoscopy with removal of polyps. Uh, and subsequently through the years, there have been multiple uh, additional studies that have reconfirmed that. And, and at this point show a strong survival advantage uh, for colonoscopic screening. And in fact, all colorectal cancer screening. Uh, so. Really, I, I think uh, Ronald Reagan in the mid 80s developed colon cancer and that kind of put it on the map a little bit. And then what really put it on the map was uh, when Katie Couric's uh, husband, Jay Monahan, died in his early 40s of colon cancer. And she went on to have a live colonoscopy uh, broadcast uh, on uh, the networks uh, in 2000. And that, I think, really demystified the procedure for the average individual. Uh, meanwhile, Center for, that. yeah, I mean, it, it was uh, it was huge at the time, uh, and I, I think people today maybe don't remember it, younger people. Uh, but uh, simultaneous with that, the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services were meeting, uh, and uh, in 1998, they approved screening colonoscopy for people with family history of colon cancer and a first degree relative, and in 2001, uh, they approved it as as a simple screening exam. Uh, for uh, prevention of colorectal cancer. Prior to that, uh, sigmoidoscopies were being done, which examined maybe the lower third of the colon, and people were referred on for colonoscopy if they had polyps. Uh, but as I said, there really wasn't any organized screening program. So CMS covers uh, Medicare people, so age 65 and older. Uh, so it always takes a couple of years for the commercial payers to catch up with CMS, uh, but in fact, they did. Uh, and so uh, in the early 2000s, screening colonoscopy became an everyday thing starting at age 50. Uh, and uh, I think thanks to people like Katie Curry, uh, Kirk, there was, there was a good adherence to it at the time. Uh, the uh, Affordable Care Act of 2010 uh, mandated free colonoscopic screening uh, as a Medicare preventive service. Uh, again, the commercial payers find ways to tack on extra charges, but uh, they did catch up, uh, and subsequently, uh, a loophole was closed uh, in 2020 
uh, again, for Medicare, because what would happen is people would come in for a screening colonoscopy, have a polyp removed, and all of a sudden it became a diagnostic colonoscopy with additional costs. So H.R. 1570 took care of that finally uh, in 2020. Again, uh, commercial payers slow to catch up to that for younger people. Uh, I, and I know you I know if you had I've had patients or I know patients where that did happen to prior to that law change. Ab- absolutely. Yeah. So uh, not a good thing in terms of driving up the costs and people understand it's a screening exa- exam. We're doing it to find polyps. So why should they be penalized if we find polyps? Right. Uh, kind, kind of crazy. I think it's getting better and better. Uh, and in addition, uh, the commercial payers uh, had another trick where if you had a colonoscopy because you had a positive uh, occult blood or fit test uh, of the stool or positive Cologuard test of the stool, they found a way to make that into a diagnostic rather than a screening study. And uh, they, they are getting better about that. And that seems to be going away with most of the payers, but not all. Um, Speaking of, can you just briefly touch on the what I think the massive disadvantage to the Cologuard or the fit testing? Sure. So, I mean, that kind of gets into the, the big buzzword now is a personalized approach to colorectal cancer screening. Uh, you know, and I think we can all agree that that the the optimal test is the test that gets done. Uh, so if 40% of the population that's eligible for colorectal cancer screening doesn't do anything, that's no good. Uh, but the non-invasive stool tests at this point involve Cologuard, uh, which is a combination of uh, multi-target DNA analysis, as well as, an, as a test for blood in the stool. Uh, and there's that, which is recommended every three years. And there's a test for occult blood. Now we call it the FIT test. Uh, and that's recommended annually in people who are eligible for colorectal cancer screening. And, you know, I, I think if someone absolutely refuses a colonoscopy, doing any of those is better than not doing it. And a positive fit test or a positive color guard mandates a colonoscopy to follow up to find what, what caused the positivity. But there's a definite difference in sensitivity. Uh, first of all, going back to personalized based on risk, well, you know, I'm not sure what that means because every American has a one in five chance of developing colon cancer in, in his lifetime. So that means we're all at significant risk. So I don't know that it makes sense to risk stratify other than to say that that people who have a family history of colon cancer are at increased risk. People who have inflammatory bowel disease are at increased risk. But basically, we are all at risk. Uh, so there's a distinct difference in the sensitivities of uh, the non-invasive tests. Uh, that I think gets glossed over a bit. They're not comparable to colonoscopy. So colonoscopy is the gold standard. Pretty much will detect all significant size polyps and pretty much find all colon cancers. The Cologuard uh, test that's promoted so heavily on television commercials will miss 8% of colon cancers that are present at the time of the test. To me, that's not a great test. Uh, it's better than nothing, as I said. It will miss 40% of advanced polyps as well. And the fit test for blood in the stool, microscopic blood, is worse than that because it will miss uh, a, a good 20% of colon cancers present at the time of the test, uh, and it will miss at least 60% of advanced colon polyps. Uh, so there's a distinct difference. So if someone were to hear his choices, that you've got these two non-invasive tests and you've got colonoscopy, if they heard the differences between them uh, and they still decide on a non-invasive test, I think that's great if they're informed. But I see all too often that patients are not informed. It's a, it's a uh, time-consuming discussion to have with a patient. But, you know, it's, it's a valuable discussion because, you know, I've had patients say, well, I don't want to do the PrEP because it's horrible. I said, well, you know, metastatic colon cancer is horrible too. So, I would take the prep and uh, it, and it's like a lot of things in life. It's in the sales pitch and taking the time to make right. sure you have that thorough discussion and it's informed consent. Now, it seems and you mentioned this previous you mentioned this to, to me in, in person, but as well on a previous podcast, younger patients are getting affected. And that's obviously a change in something. What 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 is your observation for that? So uh, there's changing tumor biology. Uh, Nature will always try to outsmart all of us. And for whatever reason, 
Uh, young, younger adults are developing colon cancer. Obviously, Jay Monahan, Katie Couric's husband, did this before it was fashionable. Uh, but basically, over the past 20 years, there's been a 2% two, 2 annual increase in the incidence of colon cancer occurring in individuals before age 50. And most of these individuals don't have any known family history of colon cancer that you could have picked up on, acted on either. The reasons for this, not entirely clear. Uh, things that, that have been discussed are, are epidemic obesity, uh, poor diets that are high in red meat, low in fiber, uh, changing, antibi uh, changing uh, microbiome of the stool due to excessive use of antibiotics. Uh, we don't know is the bottom line, uh, but it's a real phenomenon. No, and, and consequence to this, uh, we now start screening colonoscopy at age 45 rather than age 50 in an average risk individual. Uh, almost all commercial payers are on board with this at this point, which is good. And in family history, it's first degree relative 10 years prior to when they had it, right? Correct. It's still the Correct. So, so first degree relative meaning sibling or parent. And you always want to start uh, 10 years before uh, that index or start at age 40. So at either age 40 rather than age 45 or 10 years before the index cancer. Now, there takes some skills to do a colonoscopy. It's not, um, um, you know, it's not playing a Nintendo game by any measure. But so what are some kind of walk us through what 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 is uh, the standard for technique and quality metrics? So uh, that, too, has changed a, a great deal in my practice. Uh, Early on, it was considered great if we got if we got to the start of the colon quickly and came out quickly, and that was considered a great exam. And then we realized that we weren't seeing the degree of protection from colon cancer that was suggested in these studies. We were seeing what's called interval cancers uh, pop up, and the interval is defined as between the scheduled interview intervals for the col for the next colonoscopy. Uh, and we said, why aren't we duplicating uh, what was shown in these national uh, studies that were done with expert endoscopists? And, and the reason is that that quality uh, matters. And the things that matter are, are good bowel preparation uh, so that you don't miss lesions. Or if it's a not so good bowel preparation, doing, doing your darndest during the exam to, to clean everything, all this mucosal surfaces off and providing a good exam, but also taking your time. So when you're doing this uh, withdrawal, uh, it should be slow. The standard now is eight minutes or longer as an indicator of a quality exam. Uh, and uh, that, that in turn uh, is reflected in what's called an adenoma detection rate. So people who take time now will detect uh, polyps in approximately 40% of individuals. So that is up uh, and that's been shown nationally. Everybody who follows these quality metrics uh, has improved his or her detection rates by at least 10%. So what was previously considered a quality exam with 25% adenoma detection, you should now be detecting at least 40%. So the actual technique has greatly changed in my years of practice. And I think that all quality endoscopists across the country have uh, bought into this. Well, I know our endoscopists, your partners, and you yourself are, have uh, you know, role model. Uh, added normal detection rates, right? I mean, we're all, you guys are all above 40%. We're all well above 40%. Uh, another interesting uh, change in tumor biology is the increasing appreciation of an alternate pathway to the adenoma carcinoma pathway. Uh, there's something called a serrated poly uh, pathway. And these are, are flat lesions that are very subtle endoscopically. I think for years, we, we just didn't appreciate that they were there. Uh, and that also explained these interval cancers that we're developing. These have a predilection for the right side or the beginning of the colon. They're extremely subtle, uh, and they uh, go through a more accelerated pathway to colon cancer, so over five years, say, rather than 10. Uh, they're thought to account for 25% of all uh, incident colon cancers. Uh, so I, I think Looking back on it, I know that I used to see these and, and think they were nothing, and I think everybody did that. So uh, that's been a big change as well. Well, in addition to colon cancer, um, you know, sometimes patients can present with diverticulitis and inflammation of a diverticuli, and should they be 
screen for colon cancer at some point in the future if they present with that and you know and let them recover what's the what's your thought on that i i think the standard is if someone has his first episode of diverticulitis and ct proved diverticulitis so not a clinical diagnosis but if you see it on ct scan and they get treated uh they should have a baseline colonoscopy because okay. rare, rarely other intraluminal pathology can either dis, uh, appear to be diverticulitis right. or precipitate diverticulitis so that that merits uh a colonoscopy you know regardless of age yeah. we do see that in younger people sometimes that's always been my standard when i've taken care of those patients well you've seen other things other than uh colon cancer in your 30 plus years um, what are, what's some advances that you've seen maybe perhaps in like inflammatory bowel disease? Yeah. So there have been really amazing advances in gastroenterology that you're, you're so busy when you're doing it, that you, you don't stop and think about how amazing they are. So kind of wrapping up my career has, has given me pause to look back and reflect and, uh, really some amazing changes. So in inflammatory bowel disease, and we're basically talking ulcerative colitis and Crohn's disease, uh, the advent of pharmacotherapy for these diseases has, has just been dramatic. And the most dramatic is something called biological therapy. Uh, and these are large molecules uh, that, are, that are given either intravenously or subcutaneously uh, as maintenance therapy. Uh, so the, the standard that probably most people have heard of is Remicade. Uh, and, and that was approved in 1998 for Crohn's disease and 2005 for ulcerative colitis. It's an intravenous uh, medication, uh, and it's a uh, tumor necrosis factor uh, blocker. Uh, and that's a cytokine. I think cytokines are big news now with COVID-19. Yep. Yeah. Uh, so it's basically uh, an inflammatory response. And basically, inflammatory bowel disease is our own bodies attacking our GI tract. So you want to block that inflammatory response. So these are very potent blockers of one of the end stages of the cytokine, cyto, uh, cytokine pathway. Uh, and these have been dramatically uh, effective. So when I think back at early on in my career of all the patients uh, who had intractable disease, ended up going for surgery and, and ulcerative colitis, that means having your colon removed and Crohn's disease, that means having segmental resections of the GI tract. Uh, I've been sending very few people on for surgery since, since Remicade came out. Uh, we now have uh, three other tumor necrosis factor uh, blockers on the market. Uh, then we have a drug called vetalizumab or Intibio, uh, and that is a biological uh, compound given intravenously that is specific for the GI tract and doesn't affect any other part of the body, which intellectually makes some sense that you that suppressing the immune system, the entire immune system is maybe not a great idea, but having targeted therapy for the bowel uh, is good. So that's a good drug. Uh, we have another drug called uh, Eustachinumab now that's used for inflammatory bowel disease, uh, especially when there's psoriasis present as well, which is not an uncommon situation. That works uh, through a different pathway. Uh, and what's really ex exciting, because all of these are intravenous or subcutaneous uh, administration, is the advent of small molecules now. Uh, and the first mo small molecule approved was uh, called Zelgans or Tofacitinib. Uh, and it's a Janus kinase inhibitor. And it's taken as a daily pill. Uh, and it's so powerful that it's now been suggested to be used even in rescue therapy when people are, are looking, heading, heading toward colectomy. Uh, so that's just a daily pill. Uh, and now there is a, a brand new one just approved uh, which is an S1P uh, receptor modulator, uh, and that also would be a daily oral pill. That one's also used for multiple sclerosis. The uh, topocidinib is used for rheumatoid arthritis. So I think, uh, you know, anything that can make it easier for the patient and potentially less expensive uh, is a good thing. But when I think back on that, you almost never see surgery anymore it is truly amazing. Yeah, you, you really don't. And, I, you know, for me, Dean, when I was a medical, a medical student prior to, you know, I thought you had Crohn's disease and ulcerative colitis, and they were two. You know, but as I got into practice, they, they can overlap and resemble each other and really be uh, difficult to discern, and you do need to see a gastroenterologist to do it. They're, they're absolutely true. We have a, a whole bunch of people that we classify as indeterminate because we can't tell. And in the old days, you would send someone for ulcerative colitis for surgery, 
and then their disease would recur in the small bowel and realize that they really had Crohn's. So yeah, it, it is not black and white. There are many shades of gray uh, between those two diseases. Well, I think, you know, another condition that um, I've seen some changes in my practice, um, it, uh, irritable bowel syndrome, it's, it's common. Uh, it's uh, our strategies are uh, uh, at times have been disparate and just reassurance. But what, what has changed in your 30 years as regards to irritable bowel? Uh, well, pharmacotherapy has certainly advanced. Uh, so for irritable bowel syndrome, and there's irritable bowel syndrome with diarrhea, irritable bowel syndrome with constipation, mixed where people have both or just where people have pain and relatively normal bowel habits. So it's, it's a, a wastebasket uh, term for diseases that ultimately we may find out are totally different from each other. But for the diarrhea type of irritable bowel syndrome, uh, we kind of fell into the idea that antibiotic therapy can actually help. And the antibiotic is rifaximin or zyfaxan, which is a non-absorbed antibiotic. So it's not systemic. It doesn't cause some of the side effects of other antibiotics because, again, it's, it's gut specific. And it's basically killing off on a temporary basis some of the normal flora of the GI tract. And people with IBS with diarrhea uh, can get a sustained response from that. Uh, so it, it kind of we found that through the back door, but it's very effective treatment and it, it can be repeated several times a year as needed. For constipation predominant irritable bowel syndrome, uh, which has maybe been an even more vexing problem, uh, we, we've gone through a series of pro, prokinetic drugs over the year, but we actually have some very good ones now that finally work. And Linzest or Linaclotide has been dramatically effective and well tolerated. Uh, there's several others that have come down through the pike since then that are similarly effective, far better than anything we had early in my career. But perhaps the most uh, Exciting change for irritable bowel syndrome uh, for me, since I'm a bit of a therapeutic nihilist, is dietary therapy. And I think there are a lot of patients who would prefer a diet if possible. And the low FODMAPS diet, uh, which was discovered by Dr. Gibson in Australia, or at least put on the map by him, uh, about 60% of IBS patients uh, respond to a low FODMAPS, di FODMAPS diet. And what that's talking about is uh, fermentable oligosaccharides, disaccharides, uh, polyols. Tell me if I'm missing one, Dustin. Uh, it's, no, I, it's basically yeah. co complex carbohydrates. Right. Uh, and basically, uh, it's dramatically effective for most people with irritable bowel syndrome. And, and uh, they can then slowly uh, introduce foods back. Uh, so in fact, a lot of people who, who think they're gluten intolerant uh, but don't have celiac disease. It's really not the gluten per se that's in wheat. It's the fructans that they're reacting to. And that's so, why you guys do the you do the breath test, right? We do breath tests for lactose and fructose intolerance. Uh, but quite often, I find that you you restrict those when they're test positive, and they're still symptomatic uh, because basically they're intolerant of many different FODMAPs. Well, so, I can oh, say I can say this okay. that. Uh, my wife has uh, celiac, biopsy proven, um, and the quality of gluten-free products have improved over the last 25 years. Astronomically, and I, I think the celiac patients can thank the non-celiac gluten intolerant people for that because yeah. it was just a, if it was a, a niche market alone, it wouldn't have gotten as far as it has. So absolutely. Yes. Well, you know, I, you've, you, we've discussed uh, some changes that have happened with uh, the, the colon and the small intestines, of course. But, you know, I think one of the historic uh, events was gastric ulcers and how that changed. Can you reflect upon that as, as your career went on? So ab absolutely. So again, my training was, was kind of at the end of the ulcer surgery era. So in the, in the middle of my fellowship, uh, several things came out. One, the proton pump inhibitor class of acid suppressive uh, medications, omeprazole or Prilosec being the prototype, uh, and that replaced drugs like Zantac or, or Famotidine, Pepsid. Uh, and these were drugs that were dramatically uh, effective at treating ulcer disease and also GERD. So it turned intractable ulcer patients who were going for surgeries and having half their stomachs removed, all of a sudden could be well controlled on a single pill a day. 
Simultaneous with this was the discovery or rediscovery of H. pylori, Helicobacter pylori, again by a gentleman physician from down under. Things, good things seem to happen from down under. Uh, but Barry Marshall rediscovered H. pylori and its association with ulcer disease. And this bug had been intermittently found over the preceding 100 years. Uh, there's a great physician from years ago, Bazazaro, who found it. And uh, they found it on autopsy specimens, surgical specimens. They thought it was a contaminant, uh, but it's real. It's huh. a bug. It's a bug in the, in the stomach. And it's associated with stomach ulcer, duodenal ulcer, uh, and also associated with stomach cancer and lymphoma of the stomach, malt lymphoma. Uh, and by eradicating this bug, uh, you can drastically reduce your lifetime uh, risk for redevelopment of ulcer disease. So, for example, someone comes in with a bleeding ulcer, they were on ibuprofen or high-dose aspirin. Uh, if, you, if they happen to also have H. pylori found, if you treat and eradicate the H. pylori infection in their stomach, their lifetime risk uh, for developing recurrent ulcer with bleeding, even if they go back to some of those offending agents, is quite low. Uh, so, uh, again, we almost never see ulcer surgery anymore. Yeah, so very, very, very. One stew punch. Uh, the other interesting thing in my career uh, is the discovery of two new diseases. Uh, and whether they're truly new or were always there and we don't know it, I I'm not sure. Uh, but the first was during my fellowship, uh, people started writing about what's called microscopic colitis. Uh, and that's people who present with chronic watery diarrhea, uh, eight to 10 watery stools a day. Uh, and they're otherwise well. They're not having severe abdominal pain. They're not having weight loss. They're not having blood in their stool. Uh, but they're, they're basically incapacitated by the need to find a bathroom. And what was found is their colonoscopy, it looks, the lining of the, of the colon looks entirely normal. But when you take biopsies, uh, you find uh, colitis on the biopsy on what visually looks normal. Two subforms of it, collagenous colitis and lymphocytic colitis, uh, both very much treated the same. Uh, but treatment for this uh, is a uh, steroid called budesonide, uh, which is a well-tolerated steroid that doesn't have all the systemic side effects of prednisone. Uh, and it can be a short-term or a long-term maintenance therapy for them, but dramatically effective in, in eliminating diarrhea. Uh, microscopic colitis is more common in the United States than either ulcerative colitis or Crohn's disease. So, why, why, uh, why is it that you have to do, or it's favored to do right-sided biopsies to, to diagnose? The, the histologic changes uh, are more, more prevalent. It's, first of all, patchy, and it's more commonly found on the right side okay. of the colon than the left side of the colon. So that, that's one disease that kind of Maybe it was always there, and maybe we didn't biopsy what looked normal. I'm not sure. But the next disease I want to talk about clearly is a new entity uh, that started in the 1990s, and it's called eosinophilic esophagitis, or EOE. Uh, and this is a disease of the esophagus uh, that's present in all age groups, uh, but they're kind of two classic uh, presentations. In the pediatric population, these people have failure to thrive, persistent nausea and vomiting. Uh, in the adult population, the main symptom is difficulty swallowing with food impaction. They're eating a meal, and all of a sudden, some solid piece of food sticks in the mid-chest, and they can't get it up, can't get it down. They don't complain of a lot of heartburn, uh, minimal heartburn at most. Classic story, with, uh, more common in young males, but it can happen in either gender at any age. So if we see a 30-year-old with this history, and typically these are people who put up with symptoms for five or 10 years already where they've just gotten so used to eating carefully that they don't think much of it until they end up in the ER in the middle of the night with a food impaction that won't resolve. Uh, but the, and typically also they'll have allergies, allergic rhinitis, asthma uh, as a kind of a triad, but not always. So uh, this is diagnosed with endoscopy. It's got a very classic appearance. I know that we would have never passed this by as being normal. So I, I really do believe it's a new disease. Uh, it's thought to be allergic either to foodborne allergens or, or to airborne allergens. We don't know which those are, and it's probably multiple allergens. Uh, it's not uh, IgE-mediated, so allergy testing is of no value whatsoever for these people. Uh, but basically, they need to be diagnosed with endoscopy 
a lot of times they'll need to be dilated during the endoscopy uh, where they have strictures that are stretched. Uh, end stage EOE uh, gives you what's called a narrow caliber esophagus where the entire esophagus is narrowed. Uh, and uh, treatment, uh, uh, multiple prongs of treatment. Some people have what's called PPI responsive EOE and just treating them with a medicine like omeprazole can help them a lot. Uh, but a lot of people need steroids on top of it. And the steroid preparation needs to be topical. So we either have them, uh, Flovent, uh, which you use for asthma, is an inhaler. We have them swallow it uh, rather than inhale it into their lungs. Or there's a medicine called budesonide. Uh, again, what we talked about with microscopic colitis can be compounded into a gel and then swallowed uh, at bedtime so that it sits, dwells in the esophagus. Uh, dramatically effective. Uh, but there's also diet therapy for this as well. Uh, and uh, as I said, allergy testing, which is often done, is kind of a waste of time for these people. Uh, the results are not reliable at all in, in predicting what the food triggers are. Uh, but there's something called a six food elimination diet. There's a four food elimination diet. There's a two food uh, elimination diet. And basically the, the two biggest defenders appear to be dairy and wheat. Uh, and Soy and eggs are kind of intermediate, and in the group, then the group of foods that uh, rarely but can cause it uh, include seafood and nuts. Uh, so some people uh, will try the elimination diets. If you eliminate six food groups, you gradually reintroduce them uh, and see see if the difficulty swallowing comes back. Uh, we also kind of follow them histologically by doing scopes and biopsies. And this can involve a lot of scopes. So probably uh, a very new and interesting way of approaching this problem is with non-invasive or semi-non-invasive tests to assess the eosinophilic infiltration of the esophagus. So you can do what's called a string test or what's called a cytosponge and kind of uh, put something down into the esophagus, pull it back out and assess for the number of eosinophils or their degranulation products. And that's a way of following people to assess disease activity. Since symptom-wise, it, it's kind of hard because these people are so careful in how they swallow. Uh, but this is clearly a new disease uh, that's on the map, and it's extremely prevalent. And it, does does it do we know does it put us at risk for uh, esophageal cancer? It does not seem to have uh, any sequela in that regard. Unlike GERD, for example, which severe right. GERD definitely increases the risk for esophageal cancer. Well, uh, you know, I think fatty liver is increasing dramatically as people have uh, gained weight in uh, the United States or Western culture. Uh, how, how is the fatty liver, how has that, that become more prevalent in your, uh, in your tenure? So, uh, you know, I think the leading cause of liver transplantation in the 1980s and before uh, was alcoholic liver disease. Uh, then came hepatitis C. Uh, we now have uh, dramatically effective antivirals for hepatitis C that can essentially cure hepatitis C. Almost all subtypes of hepatitis C can now be cured, which uh, again is, is absolutely amazing. And not only does it cure hepatitis C, but in so doing it decreases the risk for cancer of the liver and can even improve uh, the histology. So it can convert a bad cirrhotic liver into a not so bad one. So the, the days of liver transplants for hepatitis C are waning too. So unfortunately, we have this, this entity now which has totally taken the place, which is non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. Uh, a better name for it that I, I think you'll see used now is metabolic associated liver disease. Because the reality is that a lot of people uh, who have fatty liver disease have risk, metabolic risk factors for it, and also alcohol or medications, other factors that are involved. Uh, but uh, basically, it, it seems to be a disease of obesity, uh, insulin intolerance, uh, diabetes, uh, and it's extremely prevalent. Uh, I think, uh, what did I see? Like 80% of Americans are above uh, ideal body weight, and type 2 diabetes is rampant now. Uh, so this is a, a real epidemic, uh, and it's not just the United States. Within the United States, the Midwest and the South are the biggest defenders, uh, but it's extremely prevalent in uh, Central and South America, 
and interestingly, the Arab uh, countries. Uh, so it's, it is a worldwide problem. And it's not just that these people can develop cirrhosis, but actually the risk of liver cancer, it turns out, is quite high uh, in advanced fatty liver cirrhosis, which we didn't appreciate early on. We thought it was going to be one of the forms of cirrhosis that wasn't associated with liver cancer. Incidence is quite high. And treatment, uh, you know, obviously, if, if you drink too much alcohol, cut that out. Uh, achieving ideal body weight, exercise, getting type 2 diabetes under control. Uh, those, those are all important. Uh, and we, we've seen with gastric uh, bypass surgery uh, that fatty liver can actually just melt away as long as there is not advanced fibrosis. But you do reach the point of no return. Once you get advanced fibrosis and cirrhosis, a lot of this is no longer going to be uh, reversible. So the holy grail really is pharmacotherapy. And they've looked at many, many things uh, in their phase three trials of many different drugs. Nothing has really panned out yet, but I, I got to believe that there will be advances made in this field. Was it, at one time, wasn't metformin supposed to help with that? Yes. So uh, metformin uh, was one of or the drugs I used. Uh, Ursa deoxycholic acid, or, uh, which is a, a medication that dissolves uh, gallstones. Uh, and is used for some other types of liver disease we use for that. Uh, none of those really have any benefit for uh, NAFLD. Uh, Actos, of all the diabetic agents, Actos seems to have some uh, uh, antifibrotic activity. So Actos is, is being used for it, but that's the only diabetes medicine I know. Uh, but otherwise, just getting better glycemic control is of some benefit. So but, that meant metformin could do it via that mechanism too. It could, but in terms of specifically treating the fatty liver, you know, no, it has no activity. So the holy grail is going to be actual direct acting medications, just as we came up with direct acting antivirals for hep C. Uh, there's got to be an answer. Well, we hope so. I, I had a friend from college that is post-transplant for that. So 52-ish. Uh, yeah, doing great, but uh, yeah. Now, you know, I, I remember uh, uh, Na Andy Nash uh, is a interventional radiologist in Des Moines, and I watched him do a TIPS procedure once, and I thought that was so cool. Uh, how, how did that influence your practice of these patients with decompensated liver disease? So uh, TIPS is, a, is an amazing interventional radiology procedure, and basically one of the dreaded complications of cirrhosis is the development of, of esophageal varices, which are basically varicose veins in the esophagus that bleed readily and in fact can result in an exsanguination. Uh, so people with advanced liver disease get these varices. We do endoscopic procedures where we ban them. Uh, but the TIPS procedure is basically creating a shunt through the liver. So the radiologist is passing a catheter through the jugular vein, down through the heart, into the liver, and he's creating a shunt uh, between the systemic circulation and the liver circulation, which decompresses these veins. So it, it totally eliminates the bleeding varices. Moreover, it treats some other liver conditions. So refractory ascites is where the abdominal cavity fills up with fluid and people are extremely uncomfortable, bloated. Uh, they can't eat much because they have no room for a distended stomach to go, which results in protein energy, malnutrition, and that's one of the cascading factors that leads to liver death is malnutrition. So you take care of the ascites, they can eat better. Uh, it also takes care of, what, of fluid in the lungs called hydrothorax. And there's a, a rare disease called uh, basically hypoxemia of liver disease where there's so much shunting that people can't get enough air, air into their bloodstream. Uh, so tips treats all of these things quite effectively. And so we first saw it as, as a bridge to transplant. So someone is crashing on us with these problems, a TIPS was put in and it bought you some time to wait to acquire a, a liver donor. But uh, these days it's not just used as a bridge to transplant, but it's used as long-term uh, treatment and management. Quite effective, it does have some complications. Rarely people will get decompensation of their liver disease from the TIPS. Uh, but uh, it's really uh, dramatically uh, changed and bettered uh, the quality of life for these patients. And it is a totally neat procedure to watch. Yeah, yeah, I agree. I was already an internal medicine resident. Otherwise, I would have maybe switched to interventional radiology. It's pretty cool. 
I, I've had the same feeling watching them. I agree. Yeah. Well, you know, you were uh, instrumental in helping us get a uh, fecal transplant for uh, Clostridium difficile infections. I, I like to brag that we were number one in a number two business. Uh, but t tell us how that changed. I mean, that 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 sounds very radical, but it, it has been effective. Right. So, you know, that's another thing that where old is new. Uh, so that had been tried through the years, even before they knew what C. difficile as, a, as an organism was. Uh, they knew years and years ago, these people with uh, refractory diarrhea, you gave them a stool enema and it got better. And I, I'm told that the veterinarians uh, used this for many years as well. Uh, so it's kind of rediscovered, uh, but it, it basically repopulates uh, the stool. So you can administer people who have C. C. difficile uh, diarrhea, C. difficile colitis can be an intractable problem because there's so much resistance to the standard antibiotic regimens. It's yeah. such a hard, hard bug to kill uh, because it sporulates. And when the, the bacteria is in spore form, it's resistant to all antibiotics, even resistant to Clorox, basically. Uh, so uh, they found that by administering donor stool, uh, either in enema form, through a colonoscopy, or ingested in some form, say with a nasogastric or nasoenteric uh, seeding tube, uh, really the cur cure rate is over 90% yeah. for this. The, the interesting thing is they did an experiment recently where they took donor stool and they, they killed off all the bacteria in it, but instilled it anyway. And they had almost as good a response. So there's things in stool, uh, other than the bacteria that we know of, uh, that seem seems to play a role in treating C. difficile. So I, I think that the final answers aren't in in this. Uh, and you know, because of the risk of infection associated with fecal transplant, uh, big pharma is working on uh, basically pill preparations uh, where they try to find the good bacteria uh, and accomplish the same thing. So far, they're not there yet either, and it may be because of this factor X that we don't know that's in stool. But you know, the, this is kind of the start of uh, a brand new field, which is probably the most exciting development in gastroenterology, uh, which is the intestinal microbiota. So we, we are basically a walking zoo and a walking uh, Petri dish. So we have uh, different microbiomes. We have the GI microbiome where we're teeming with bacteria and yeast and viruses, and we, we don't really know what. Uh, there's also the microbiome of the skin, microbiome of the lungs. Uh, so this probably has a fundamental effect on disease states uh, that we're only beginning to understand now. So probably the, our, the bacteria that live within us and some other organisms probably determine, you know, whether we're skinny, whether we're obese, whether we get rheumatoid arthritis, whether we get inflammatory bowel disease. Uh, it's an emerging uh, field that we're only beginning to understand. So, you know, people are very excited about prebiotics and probiotics. Controlled studies of these agents, you know, haven't really come up with anything yet because you're basically each of those has like one organism in it. Right. So, so the entire fecal microbiome, it, it's like think of a, of a nice zoo. There are many, many animals in it. So we don't know which ones are good, which ones are bad. Uh, and, you know, there could be unt untoward consequences where you treat one thing and another thing happens. So all we know is, is that there's tremendous work to be done with the microbiome. You can actually, there are companies that will sequence your microbiome for you and give you a, a nice readout on the 20 most common uh, organisms that are within you. I don't know that that's a, a much value, uh, but it's fascinating. For example, uh, they've seen that, that kids who were born by C-section have an increased rate of asthma and allergies, uh, and it's thought because they're not passing through the birth can, uh, canal, yeah, not being right. exposed to vaginal secretions. So a lot of times now, OB will, will do a vaginal swab and uh, put it in the kid's mouth after they're born, uh, whether that works or not, but I mean, it makes a lot of sense really. So, I mean, this is, this is the next frontier for, I think, all of medicine is understanding our microbiome. Uh, and it's not necessarily numbers of organisms, but it's probably the types of organisms uh, that are present. What we call dysbiosis is probably the cause of disease. 
And how we get to dysbiosis, I don't know. Certainly antibiotics uh, may play a role. The overuse of antibiotics change, change uh, our microbiome over time. Uh, and uh, life changes it. So for, it's thought that we acquire our fecal flora uh, soon after we're born. Uh, so if you look at a family, the young children will have very similar microbiomes. If you look at a, a husband and wife couple that have lived, that have been together for 40 years, their microbiomes will be very much the same uh, and no longer resemble their siblings at all. So there's clearly an interplay with the environment. That's fascinating. Uh, I do, re you know, you, when, when I was a medical student in the early 90s, um, you kind of look, you kind of thought that uh, C. diff was kind of a benign condition that they tested for it like on Mondays and Thursdays. You know, they the lab did, they batched them. And, uh, oh, I guess about 2007, 2008, we just really start, you know, we started to see the C. diff that was killing people uh, from the community. Uh, and I still remember uh, Dr. Kopeski doing a, uh, 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 colectomy for toxic megacolon, and it looked like he was just holding up a big, uh, largemouth bass. You know, it's just this huge colon from C. diff. It, it's absolutely become a lethal condition. Uh, what was easily treatable with a simple, cheap antibiotic became something that that recurs 40 to 60 percent of the time after yeah. the initial therapy, and the antibiotics to treat it have become increasingly expensive. And over prolonged courses, six six week courses, we even have monoclonal antibodies now that have some activity uh, at people who are a high risk for recurrence. Uh, but yeah, I mean, I think the fecal transplants have been dramatically effective. Unfortunately, in the era of COVID, uh, unless it's a very impending emergency or unless you're a center of excellence, you really can't get the donor stool. We were all, I think everyone in the country was using donor stool from this open biome uh, company open biome, in Massachusetts. Yeah. And uh, they, right at the start of the pandemic, they had some problems with some deaths because of uh, E. coli that they hadn't screened for in the donor stool. And then we became very concerned that we could possibly transfer COVID-19 in the donor stool. So those are pretty much on hold now. You know, and, and it was thought that these pills would uh, finally be approved, but they don't look like they're working. So huh. we don't have anything to substitute for them. I think there are a lot of backyard fecal transplants going on, you know, between uh, family members uh, and an enema bag. So. So someone else wants to be number one in a number two business. I'm afraid we may have lost it. Yeah, darn it. Well, Dean, uh, thanks for joining me. This has been fun. You've been a you, you are a, a friend and, and been a great colleague, and I'm certainly going to miss having you around. I know you still be around. I can still pester you if I need you, but uh, uh, this has really been great information. Again, this is uh, gastroenterologist Dr. Dean Abramson. For more information or schedule your colonoscopy, talk with your primary care provider or contact St. Luke's Gastroenterology at 319-366. 8695. That's 366 8695. Thank you very much, Dustin. Thank you for listening to Live Well Talk On. If you enjoyed this episode, don't forget to subscribe. And if you want to spread the word, please give us a five star review and tell your family, friends, neighbors, strangers about our podcast. We're available on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Pandora, or wherever you get your podcast. Until next time, be well. <laughs>